Um, well, I understand it's a bit loud in here, so if anyone has problems hearing me, just put your hand up, let me know. Otherwise, I think uh, Sean and Ronak might give me a speaker. So I came in last uh, October, November, and we did a talk. And um, it seemed like some people kind of tuned into the talk and other people didn't really. So I'm going to kind of switch it up a little bit, but I'm going to still touch on a lot of the same issues. But before we start, I just want to ask how much exposure or how much have you guys considered legal issues you might be facing with respect to your technology, your developments? Um, I guess it depends how far along you are, but have you considered what's going to happen when you actually want to commercialize? Um, if anyone has, let me know. Okay. <laughs> we've, we've spoken a couple of times too, right? So, okay, great. Right. But the thing was is that uh, it was coming from a Japanese site that was had an English side to it, and it was Jap translated from the Japanese to the English side using terms like copyright free or you don't want to worry about copyright if you like, get this product. Okay. You use this for the production of a game. Now, I'm familiar with like, you know, Creative Commons kind of contracts, but like licenses. Yeah. But what kind of contract is that impose? Right. Like, Exactly. That's, that's a great point. I'm not sure if you guys heard that in the back, but basically um, he's, he's brought in content from another country and it's subject to a license. And translating that license, it's likely there was some mistranslation in there. Um, and I'm, I'm going to speak a little bit about licenses and assignments. I wasn't really going to speak about open source, but I'll touch on the issue a little bit. Uh, there's a kind of a misconception in the technical community that open source might just allow you to use, this, use the code as you see fit. But really what you have to do is read the license that comes with that code. Not every license is the same. There is the GNU license, but there's different uh, tailorings of that. Some are, some are allowing you to use the code whatever you want to do, which is great. But other ones don't allow you to use it commercially, or they don't allow you to, to use it outside of a research environment, for example. You need to know what you are and are not allowed to use that for. Otherwise, you're going to be infringing the copyright of the code owner. So great point. Thanks for that. Um, I'm going to start going. As I speak, if anyone has any questions or thinks that maybe I'm going too fast or too slow, just let me know and I'll adapt. So basically what I want to talk about today is all the kind of legal issues you guys want to, want to cover. But I'm not going to go into it too much depth other than the intellectual property side and specifically patents, which will cover the inventions and the, and the developments that you guys are making. But there are a lot of other issues you need to consider and copyright, trademark, Corporate law, these are all things that you're going to have to put your mind to. And again, you can talk to us um, another time about your questions. Uh, so yeah, once again, on the business side, you're, you're probably not really near this stage. And a lot of uh, startups are, are not really getting to this point. A lot of, a lot of the upfront development that you're going to do is really getting your technology out there, getting some investment, getting some VCs to come in, for example. And incorporation might not be necessarily the first thing you need to do. Once you have some of that coming in and you've started kind of a, a cycle and you're rolling along, you might want to come back to this issue. But for now, what you really want to worry about is disclosure of your intellectual property and development of your intellectual property. Yeah. It's a great question. Um, okay, you should be setting up different partnerships, uh, different arrangements to govern who you're working with. And actually, that's going to be the bulk of what I'm going to talk about. So I'll, I'll just I'll get to it. Um, if I don't answer the questions you want, let me know. Okay. So just briefly, I, I think that a lot of you might be on different understandings of how intellectual property works. What are the different types of intellectual property? So I think for some of you, this will be very rep repetitive, and others. You might get something out of it, so I'll just go over it very briefly. There's three main kinds of intellectual property. There's others as well. But patents, trademarks, and copyright are the most well-known types of intellectual property. Patents will cover inventions and technology and the way you're doing things. Uh, trademarks, on the other hand, cover branding, logos, slogans. They don't cover anything about the actual work. They only cover how you're marketing that work. And finally, copyright will only cover the actual instantiation of your ideas. So when you write code, the code itself is covered by a copyright. 
but the way that all that code works together and actually produces a result that's more patentable than copyright. Um, I'm also going to talk a little bit about the structures for rewarding contributions, and that's related to the question we just uh, heard about the partnerships. Assignment and license, which is again related to your question, and open source. So just talking about patents generally, like I said, is to cover inventions and technology developments. You're going to get into joint development issues again, and you need an IP strategy. And you're going to see I'm going to zoom through a lot of these slides. There's other ones that I'm going to keep a little more uh, interest on. So what you need to know about patenting in general is you can only patent something that's not already out there. You can only hold a monopoly over technology that hasn't already existed. So what you have to know going into, into it and you probably have a pretty good idea of what is out there. You need to know if it's new. If what you're doing is new and it produces something useful, it's likely patentable material. There are exceptions. You can't patent things about portfolio management in Canada, for example, and general software patents you can't, you can't cover. But if that software does something, if it actually produces a result, it's, it could be patentable. That's something we have to go through in a little more detail. You can come and talk to me about it. Uh, when you actually create a patent, what you're doing is you're writing a story about how you can actually put together this invention and uh, somebody can reproduce it. So if I'm somebody reading your patent, I can do exactly what it says in there and I can reproduce what you've done. In exchange for giving me that, you're getting a 20-year monopoly on being the only person who can actually do what you're saying can be done. After 20 years, it becomes public domain. And in this era of technological innovation, 20 years obviously is a very long time. So it's good to start thinking about how commercializable is your technology. And if it, if it is you know, marketable, you probably want to protect it before, before starting to use it and making it not new anymore, in which case you can't patent it anymore and anyone else can practice it too. Um, now there are a couple of differences, to, sorry, differences between Canada and the US. Um, actually, before I go into that, I should clarify, having a patent only, only goes by country. It's jurisdictional. So if you apply for a patent in Canada, you're covered in Canada against other people doing your tech, other people practicing your technology. You'll have to file a corresponding application in the US, another one in Europe, and in every other jurisdiction you might want to consider, like China, India, those are growing examples. Taiwan's a growing example. Uh, but with that in mind, there are differences amongst each of these jurisdictions, and the only really universal truth to protecting your technology is to file your patent application very early on before you've talked to anybody and get your technology in the ground, get a claim to it, and then start commercializing. So uh, first to file versus first to invent is it's a technical uh, procedural thing between Canada and US patent offices. In Canada, if there's two inventors who independently create the same invention, the first one to put their application into the patent office is the, first, is the one who's going to end up getting a patent out of it. Whereas in the US, you can later litigate it and say, well, I really came up with it first, even though the other guy didn't know, I have the right to it. Now, there's also a US provisional patent, which is not really a patent, a patent at all. It's really just a document you file with the patent office. You can do it today. And then within a year, you can really hammer out the details of your technology and then file a regular patent application and try to get protection on that patent application. Um, now, this is all related to market potential, obviously you probably wouldn't be filing a provisional application not knowing what your marketability is. Uh, you probably want to wait to see if there is a market out there and within a year of establishing that, you should get a real application in. But if you know that, if you have a really good idea anyways, that there's likely some, some money involved and you know you can get to market, you know that people are going to want to pay for this technology, you probably want to file your application now. And I'll get into why um, in a couple of slides. Uh, we don't really need to talk about that. Okay, so this is uh, very important uh, for you all to know. The second slide here is, is the technology, or the second point, sorry, is the technology patentable? And public disclosure is a big problem. And to be quite honest, I'm sure that some of the people in this room have probably already violated this, this point. Once you talk to people outside of a confidential relationship, you, it's no longer a new technology. You've made it public and it's in the public domain anybody can use your technology. So make sure that when you are speaking with people, especially in, uh, investors or other people, say, in the building that are going to work on this technology with you, but maybe the relationship falls apart on a business side and they're not going to work with you, make sure that it's under an obligation of confidentiality. And that can be a handshake. It can be an understanding. 
it would be better if it's in writing, but it doesn't have to be. There's no requirement that it's in writing. It just helps you prove that there is a confidential relationship there. Um, so once you've disclosed it outside of the confidential relationship, you're going to come within uh, different requirements for different countries of how you can get a patent in that country. I'll get into that a bit later. But selective disclosure and NDAs are two really good ways to avoid this whole problem of talking to everybody. Um, only discuss the technology with people you need to, which will be people you want to work with, or investors, or you know, market research firms, us for example. And for the other people, or even for those people uh, rather, you want to have them sign NDAs. So again, it's in writing. You know it's all confidential. And not, um, not all NDAs are, are the same. NDA, sorry, is a non-disclosure agreement. Uh, they're not all the same. You want to make sure that you shore up all the, the loopholes and you know, they can't use your technology for other purposes besides what you tell them for. There's a lot of different language that should go into that. But at the outset, just make sure there's an understanding that nothing you say is supposed to be you know, sent to the next guy and the next guy and the next guy and it just spreads like wildfire and then you lose all your uh, protection uh, capabilities. So like I said, once you discuss something out of a confidential relationship, you're going to be subject to different rules in different places. Now in, the Can in Canada and the US, within one year of, uh, of your disclosure, you can still file a patent application. It's a one year grace period. So if I talk to uh, one of you guys today and say, you know, I have this great idea, here's how it's going to work, and I tell you everything about it, by February the 9th of 2010, I can file my application and still get uh, sufficient protection in Canada and the US. However, in uh, Europe, and this is foreign or international filings, in Europe, once you've disclosed, you're done. You can't file a patent application anymore. Uh, the technology is public in Europe. So generally what we recommend is file your provisional patent application right away in the US. And that can be really any document. Um, you might have a software description document or you know, some kind of a technical spec that can be filed as a provisional patent application. It's not the best. You probably want to work with somebody to actually make a patent out of it, uh, have the right language in there, make sure it covers the right aspects of your technology, and then file that as a provisional. But if you're really up against the wall, you want to get something into the patent office, it's pretty low cost, and you then have one year to file a regular application. And that allows you then to file a regular application anywhere else, virtually anywhere else in, in the world. There are some countries that won't really go along with the scheme. But once you've filed in one country, generally you have one year to file in every other country and claim the same date as that first one. So that's the provisional system. And that's uh, the next point, foreign or international filing within one year is what I'm, what I'm just speaking about here. Now the other type of application we often work with is called a PCT. And that's a patent cooperation treaty. It's an international filing. You file in one place, which you, you can do it in Canada. And within about three, three and a half years, you can then send that filing to other countries. And you can choose within those years, you know, you see a market in the US, you see a market in Australia, maybe those are the only two countries you want to go to. So it's a really good uh, way to reduce costs now and kind of shift costs down the road. Uh, just before I go on, is everyone uh, okay with what's, what's been said so far? And is there any points that you guys wanted to discuss before I move on? No? Okay. So I'll get into joint development, and I think that was the question that we were talking about, right? So this is going to happen in this building. A lot of you guys, I know, you meet up in conference rooms, you talk about your technology, you work together, um, and you'll, you'll go back and forth. There's a lot of issues you need to think about while you're going into this, and I think that now you, you might have you know, a good working relationship that's great, but you want to shore it up now while you have that. So. Let's go through all this. Okay, so there's owners and inventors. And this is owners of intellectual property. So whoever invents the actual technology will become the owner of the technology. And to invent technology just doesn't mean that you know, two guys are working together, they're both inventors. It's the one who actually came up with the concepts, or maybe they both did, then they're both inventors. But if one person is just implementing and the other one's actually doing all of the conceptualization, that's going to be a sole inventor. So a good thing to think about is who's going to be doing that work and you know, allocate all of the uh, ownership to that person. Or if you think that one person is going to do the work, but somebody else comes up with something, maybe that should also be allocated back to the first person. Just to keep everything clean, it's always simpler to have a single entity, a single person 
owning the intellectual property rather than having it sent through other people. And the reason for that is there's differences, again, in different countries. So in Canada, if you have two different owners of one piece of intellectual property, I mean, if it's, say, the two of us own a piece of intellectual property, a technology, you can go and sell your share in it without asking me, and I can sell my share without asking you. But I can't license another company to use that technology without first asking my business partner. Now, in the US, I can do whatever I want. If I want to license my share out and say, you know, I, I can say, okay, you can sell this product and I don't have to ask uh, my business partner at all. So you want to make sure that, especially in this kind of international marketplace, you have everything kind of allocated at the outset, you know what you're getting into, and there's no real misunderstanding of terms. And, um, you know, I, I guess this is a good point to say this, but, I mean, you're in this, uh, you're in Velocity, you know, it's a very congenial atmosphere, it's a very uh, helpful atmosphere. You guys are helping each other create each other's technology. And this is not to say that every relationship is going to fall apart. That's not at all what I'm trying to get at. It's, it's more about protecting yourself and protecting each other from future problems that might happen, say, when down the road a fifth owner down the line is saying, well, look back then, I mean, all of these problems were occurring with their, with their intellectual property. Who owned it at that time? We don't know. It can really cut into, into say, the value of your assets. If it's uncertain whether you actually own it, you're not going to be able to actually commercialize it for the same amount of money. You might not be able to do the same things or transfer it. And these are things that might occur five, ten years down the road when you've you know, gotten more successful, you've commercialized, you have a lot of investment coming in. So this is a really good time early on in the growth stage to address these issues. Um, now there's different ways of determining allocation. Yes, sorry. Sorry, I just had a question. Um, hypothetically, if you were in some sort of partnership where you both own the IP for something mm -hmm. and uh, you, I don't know, in the States and you went and licensed it to a company, would you be obliged to give any of the profits back to your partner or would you just be... The, you know, would you just take all of the benefits from uh, licensing it and you would be... Well, so if you were in the U.S., for example, you could do whatever you want. So you don't have any obligation to do anything. In Canada, there are certain other obligations that trigger. So if you license it out without the approval of your other partners, uh, I believe that the, the general result of that is that you'll have to account for profits down the road. And there might be further damages. So, for example, if that, other, if that other party that you license to cuts into the, your company's profits, you're probably going to have to come uh, compensate for that too right. with your partners. It's really on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay. So it's, you know, it's, it's kind of unpredictable and that's, I guess, another reason why you want to think about that it's up front. very different systems. I'm surprised at this. Yeah. Well, it, yeah, I mean, it all goes back to, you know, original property rights and land and, mm -hmm. you know, different uh, starts to that. So it's, all countries really have... Off of this thing. So all countries, yeah, really have developed differently. Uh, we're very close to, say, closer to UK than we are to the US, being a Commonwealth, Commonwealth country. So, any other questions? Okay. So, uh, how to determine allocation or ownership of your technology? There's any number of ways. I mean, you can come up with your own schemes. There's no set way. It has to be A, B, or C. These are three common methods. Uh, whatever goes into it, you keep. Whatever comes out of it, you split. That's the first one. Allocation by need might be you're working on the same thing, you're, but you're in different industries. So whoever can use it more at the end of it, that's the, that's the party that's going to own the IP. And finally, you can assign everything into a third company and hold shares in that company. And in, in that way, you can both control the, the decision making on maybe a, a vote basis or really any kind, of, uh, any kind of decision making power that you put into it. So these are just three common ways. Sorry, I might have gone through one in there. Yeah, I think I went through one by mistake. Oh, is it? Yeah, thanks. I'm way back here. I'm not really sure where I went. Sorry about this. Okay. Um, okay, so what doesn't work and Again, it's, it's likely that a lot of you guys are in this position right now. But not having a clear strategy of what's going to happen after you've gotten through development is probably the number one killer of, of your technology right now. Um, you need to kind of make sure that the idea that you're, that you're bringing forward stays either with you or you know that it's going to go to other people and they're going to share it with you. If you don't know up front, you're probably going to be in for some surprises and someone's not going to be happy. It's not going to be the best way to move forward. 
Uh, not covering all the bases is again another problem. Uh, you might not envision all the different types of commercialization that could occur with your technology. You might not envision people dropping out of, your te of uh, development or people coming in. These are all things you need to think about at the outset and kind of envision what's going to happen, how you're going to do it, and come to an agreement with your, with your business partners, your development partners, of how you're going to handle these situations. Uh, risk profiles is another one. I don't think that's really as much of an issue here. Um, I mean, if, if one party is putting in a lot of money and the other one's not putting in so much but doing a lot of development, there might be different expectations there. I'm not, again, sure that's really uh, too applicable. And expectations and development, same thing. I mean, anything could happen in a five-year development cycle. I mean, five years is a very long time. Uh, you want to make sure that you have a way to figure it out or it's already figured out. So these are certain ways of just thinking about these issues and getting into a method where you can actually come up with solutions to these problems. So I mean, number one is retain ownership as much as possible. If you have two people and both, both want all the ownership, that's obviously not going to work. But um, generally, you should, generally, people will go into it saying, well, I want everything, but I'll negotiate it down. Common negotiation, obviously. Uh, but formalizing the IP. So what I mean by this and compartmentalizing is you come in with all of this knowledge. And I mean, it spans different areas. So it's saying, I don't know, I'll come up with an example like the internet, for example. So you have, uh, you have Ethernet, that's, that's one technology. You have TCP IP, a protocol. You have uh, different uh, web browsers, for example. So you have all of these different things that work together to actually make something happen. Each of these are different technologies. And if one person was to come up with all of this, you'd probably want to go into development knowing that these are three different things. You want to protect them in three different ways and actually outline those three different things in an agreement. If you just say, OK, well, the technology is going to be owned by everybody, or the technology is going to be owned by me, it's not really clear what the technology is. And later on down the road, when this thing's worth a billion dollars, someone's going to come and say, well, you know, that wasn't really considered. I think that I have a part of that. Well, then you're kind of in trouble. So what you want to do is really think about what is your technology? What is the commercializable aspect of it? What's the new part? It's likely that you're developing your technology around something that's already existed, and you're, you're coming up with a little piece of it. That piece is your technology, really. It's not the rest of the, devel of the development. So you really want to put extra focus on that piece. Um, and another way, and I'm, again, not too sure if this is as applicable to you, but it is a good point to think about, to repatriate ownership of milestones are not met. So you might be in, again, a five-year development cycle. At year one, you want to have a beta release out, for example. If that doesn't happen, and if you see the writing on the wall, this development's not going not to go on the pace that you wanted, or it's not going to go at all, you probably want to take everything back and start fresh or start with someone new. Uh, again, a clear definition of your technology and your IP. Uh, background IP is a term for what you're bringing into the relationship uh, as opposed to what's coming out of the relationship. So it's all your knowledge that you have now. And you generally will hold on to that. Uh, if you don't really address this background IP point when you're coming up with your collaboration, what could happen is your knowledge that goes into the relationship becomes jointly owned. And there's really no economic reason that you should be giving that up. So you probably want to keep that out of it and make sure that it's, it's stated that everything background stays with you. Um, and finally, rights to improvement and make improvements on the technology. Uh, this can go however you want it to as well, but you come up with your core technology. And again, 10 years down the road, uh, one of the guys comes up with a great idea about it and they want to move forward. Well, there should be some kind of a structure of how they can do that with your consent or without your consent, however you want to keep it. And then there's exclusive, non-exclusive, and sole rights. So this is for licensing. Now, if two parties are together and they're working on something together and they both own it, uh, you might want to consider the different licenses that can go out to a third party. So say you might want to license IBM to, to do something with, with your technology. They can have exclusive, non-exclusive, or sole rights. And these are all different. Exclusive means that IBM's the only one who can do it. Non-exclusive means you can keep licensing out to Cisco, to I guess not Nortel, but you know, other companies like that. And sole means that you're licensing out to IBM and you're yourself saying, I'm not going to use it either. I'm only going to give it to you, IBM. So you'll get you know, different investment with this, but also you should know what your business partner envisions uh, their, their piece to come to when you do these kinds of things. Um, not really important. So this is basically what you should be thinking of from today. 
Um, you want to have a strategy around disclosure and protection. This goes back to your NDAs. I, I would stress that when you speak with especially investors, um, other developers, people around campus, your professor for example, you really should have NDAs around your technology. I mean you can speak about, oh I'm working on this cool new project, it does blank. That's f generally okay. Just don't say, well it works because you know this piece connects to this piece, connects to this piece, and then you've just gone and told someone else how to do what you're trying to do. So make sure you have some kind of protection in there. Uh, a timeline for key IP filings. Again, once you've figured out how you want to move forward, generally you want to act as fast as, fast as possible and we'll get something uh, filed for you or you know you can potentially do it yourself and get a patent application in, either a provisional, a PCT, etc. Uh, the key contracts being the development contracts that you're working with other people, uh, you're working with investors coming in, what are they going to get out of it, etc, etc. Um, and monitoring really is kind of the, the basic piece here. You want to keep monitoring everything. As you're moving forward, as you're growing, make sure you have a good knowledge of what rights are allocated to which people, who has a claim on what you're doing, things of that nature. And budgeting. Budgeting is really tough. Um, you probably don't have a lot of funding at this point. You need to be, you need to be very strategic with how you're spending your money. Uh, I guess the best way that I would recommend you spend your money is make sure you do it in a way that's going to allow you to grow rather than just being, you know, up front not really spending but then you kind of lost all your marketability. These are decisions you have to obviously make. They're kind of risk analysis type of uh, decisions. That's the end of my talk but I want to open up the floor to any other questions you might have. Uh, I'm not sure if I already answered your question. Did I get to it? Yeah, well there's definitely going to be tax issues. So how do you deal with that? Well, you generally want to bring in a tax advisor. That will be number one. But basically what you're going to look at is corporations do pay less taxes, but there's other problems with, with corporations. Uh, for example, there's a setup cost. You have to set it up. You have to, you're going to have shareholders. You're going to have, well, unless you're the sole shareholder, which is possible too. Uh, there's filings you're going to have to do. So there's other com uh, burdens with having a corporation. You can have everything by yourself. There's no huge liability aspect, except that if, yeah, if something goes wrong, if, if, you're, com if you're liable because of your technology, then you're going to be personally liable. There's a lot of risk analysis there. A partnership is just like being personally liable, except there's two of you. Okay, so is there any like, legal paperwork you have to do to do that, or can you just agree to be partners? You can just agree to, to be partners. Uh, generally, partners will have a partnership agreement. It's just between them. It's not a legal requirement. It doesn't have to go to the government, for example. Incorporation is with the government. So you're filing an incorporation document with Ontario government or the Canadian government or really anywhere, Delaware, Arizona, those are popular choices too. With a partnership, it's just between you and your partner and that's actually where all of that joint development stuff comes in. You want to have all the agreements set up between yourselves, agree on exactly who's going to own what, exact, uh, sorry, agree on exactly who's going to make decisions, things of that nature and I think that's probably the structure you're going to end up going with. When you actually get to the commercialization stage, you probably will want to go with a, with a corporation. On, on a non-legal level, it does show a level of seriousness to investors. It shows that you're really thinking about structuring your, your commercial enterprise. So, I mean, there's, there's business reasons you want to do that too. Okay. Any other questions? I think it's a great question. Um, I wouldn't agree with your contact. <laughs> it may or may not be less defensible. I, I'm not sure if that's really even true. I think the difference is there's a lot of poorly written patents out there. And those patents are probably up for invalidity. You know, if, if I want to attack those patents, I can probably do that. But the really good companies with the really good technology or people who are coming up with great technology will come up with good patents. 
a lot of the problem with the patent system now is that, and in, in the US this has kind of been fixed in the last three months a little bit, they did allow a lot of business method patents and, and a, a business method patent. So for an, for an example of what that is, uh, there was one in October and this actually changed all the law in the US with respect to these kinds of patents. The patent was for a method of hedging risks in the stock market which basically involved you sell to one guy and you sell to another guy. And that was the patent. And you can't really cover that in a patent. It's not technology, it's not, it's not useful. So the problem with the patent system is based around issues like that. If you have a really well-written patent, if you have something that actually says what you're trying to do, it, it satisfies all the requirements of patent law in whatever country it's in, it, it's of course equally defensible. The other aspect of it is Again, with the, you, know, you want to go with a corporation maybe because it's more, it looks more serious. It looks like you've really thought about the issues. A patent will really generally help you bring in funding because the, the, the financer will know or will have an impression that you've thought about your technology. You think it's something breakthrough. You think it's worth the upfront investment of trying to get a patent. And you might end up with kind of like a return on that investment. So yeah, there's a couple of other factors there. But generally speaking, I, I would not agree with that at all. Any others? Yeah. This is kind of a tangential question, but back then you said that the patents apply to specific regions. Yes. Uh, is, does that work with like, company names and stuff as well? Like if there's a company that has a certain name other than Russia, mm -hmm. would I get in trouble with using the same name over here? No, you, you won't generally. Um, what happens is when you want to incorporate, you, you may or may not choose a name. You'll see a lot of companies out there with like 234567 Ontario Limited. They didn't choose a name. You don't have to. When you do choose a name, the government that you're filing your corporate documents with, say Ontario for example, they'll do a quick search to see if there's any other similar names in Ontario with the same, same government. If there's not, you have, an, you have an entitlement to that name. Now, Canada-wide, or within each country, there's also trademarks, and I got to that at the start with branding and company names and stuff. So you, you don't want to really be confusing with trademarks either. If you're only operating in Canada, you're only up against trademarks in Canada. If you're only operating in the US, you're only up against trademarks in the US. If you're a multinational, then yeah, you're going to start thinking about, well, if a company has this trademark in Russia, I probably don't want to use it in Canada because then I have to have a rebranding going on. But Doing something in Canada with a guy only in Russia doing something, you're not really in any kind of issue there. Yeah. So how does this count for if you're selling in multiple different countries on the digital value of your product? Well, I mean, you're going to have to consider where your big markets are, where you're actually doing selling. And you really should be looking into who else is using those names, those logos, those, that branding in those other countries. Now, I know you're working on a company that's going to be a website, right? Uh, or it's a game, sorry. Yeah, it's yeah. Downloadable game. OK, downloadable game. So um, you're really going to have to know what countries you're going to end up going into. And you're actually going to have to know about copyright in those countries, branding, uh, whether your technology is infringing patents in each of those countries. It's, it's kind of hard when you're, when you're going international. You need to know about all of these things. I mean, generally, it's not that, that huge of an issue. You, you want to do a quick internet search and see who else is doing this. Do an internet search for the name you want. If you find something, then you find something. And if you don't, you don't. Okay? But yeah, basically each country you're going to have to think about separately. And then so if you end up selling in the country where there's already a company with the same name, is that a legal issue or is it just that consumers might be confused or something? It's a legal issue between you and the other company. Uh -huh. It's not like you're breaking the law, like a criminal law. Not at all. Uh, if the company chooses to say that you know, they're using our trademark, it's, it's an infringement of trademark then they can, they can cite that against you and you know, take you to court or try to settle. Generally, you'll settle with them um, if they come and come after you. Often what happens is before you actually said, you know what, we're going to sue you, uh, what people usually do is send a cease and desist. So they'll ask you to stop using it. If you think they're, in the, if you think they're right, you probably want to stop using it. So you'll, you'll face the issues as they come. I mean, these issues come up all the time. Uh, it's an international marketplace right now. It's always going to be from this point. Uh, you're not going to really escape these problems. You just have to kind of move with the, with the flow. So another related question, uh, this time I'm talking about different types of domains. If I'm making, say, software, and there's a company that makes like, four shoes or something, and they have a similar name, is that like grounds for them to come after us? Or 
It's unlikely. It's unlikely. Generally, at least under Canadian trademark law, the, mar the, the goods or the services have to be similar. So the test in Canada is confusingly similar to the consumer. So if a consumer is not going to be confused between horseshoes and software, and they're probably not, you're probably okay. If you have software for selling pizza, and another guy has software for selling fried chicken, for example, that's a little closer, right? So, and, and if the marks are not the same, like if you're selling under the trademark, I don't know, velocity, right? And the other guy's selling under a trademark acceleration, that could be actually pretty close because they're kind of the same idea, same concept. There's a lot of factors, but that would be pretty separated, I would say. You'll find a lot of companies with the same name. I mean, there must be 35 Onyxes in Canada, but uh, they're all allowed to work together, you know? Okay. Let's say you have one patent and you decide not to patent two of them. That's a good question. Um, I would recommend that if you know you're going to do that, you release it publicly. And that's, it's, it's called defensive protection or defensive, uh, defensive patenting. Basically what you're doing is you're releasing something to the public and by doing that, at that instant, you've barred everyone from patenting that particular technology unless they have an earlier claim. Now in the US there might be an earlier claim if they invented it first. It's going to be very hard for them to, to establish that. Um, but Worldwide, once something is disclosed by another person, yes, you, you've lost all possibility of protection. So yeah, if you want to do that and you want to bar someone else, as soon as you disclose it, you're pretty safe. Yeah. Good question. Anyone else? It doesn't have to be any IP issues. It can be really anything on the legal side, strategy side. Yeah. Right. Well, it's, just, it's basically when you incorporate, you're given this numbered company. You can either choose a name or not choose a name. And sometimes people will just, you know, go into business and just say they're using a name, but they haven't actually registered that name. So they can be two, three, four, five, six limited operating as or doing business as whatever name. There's really no issue with doing that. Uh, the problem is, you know, unless you actually stake a claim to that name, Somebody else can then come in and say, well, I'm going to use this name. So it would have been better if you at first said, you know, I want this name on the register of the Ontario Corporation uh, database. And then you have it. And then you should also file a trademark in Canada saying, I'm going to sell goods and services under this name. So you'd be better protected that way. So unless someone else comes along, you're okay, generally. Okay. So I suppose like, The incorporation itself shouldn't really be affected. The difference is basically going to be having an agreement between those shareholders. Mm -hmm. And this is just talking about private. If you're going public, there's a whole bunch of other issues, right? But within private, you need a shareholders agreement between you guys to allocate voting rights, dividend rights. I mean, there's a lot of things that come along with having shares. Mm -hmm. So it is going to be more complicated. The actual upfront cost just on the government side, I'm quite sure is not, is not different. Um, I can I can find out for you and get back to you. Okay. Yeah. Because I'm trying to like, get this thing sort of done in a more specific way. And I mm -hmm. think I need some of the things. Okay. Yeah. So when you get to that stage, it'll probably be a good time to contact us and say, you know, what do we have to do? Because there's really quite a few, a few things. Once once you have other partners in, and if you're going to go with a corporation, you probably want to start shoring up everything and make sure everything's pretty solid. Okay. Yeah, Ted. Well, I guess it depends what part of the technology they're going after, right? Just based on your understanding of what's going on in the market. Like, do these companies do you know? Or are you I mean, it, it seems to me that mo it's more based on commercial viability um, and less based on we're going to get our technology patented. I don't really see a lot of those companies doing a lot in the patent marketplace. But um, who knows, maybe it could change. I think things change so fast as well. I'm not sure if they're seeing the long-term benefit of it. But... Um, it would be very hard for me to speculate on that in the future, obviously. <laughs> Was there a question over here that I saw? No? Yeah. Um, 
Yes. Uh, so are you a TA with the university here? No. Or, okay. Well, generally what you, I would say that the general probability is that it's public information. But you probably want to go back to the source of the, uh, of the technology and check with them. Um, I wouldn't go about using technology without knowing what the terms are of using the technology. It's the same with open source. I mean, I can find code on the internet and not really look at the license and just assume it's free. But there is a license with it. And you should really understand what you're allowed to do. And if you're not sure, you should probably contact the people that you're getting it from. So I would say just be, be wary of that. I mean, generally, this is, this is becoming less and less true as time goes on. But generally in the past, a lot of universities would just release information or give it away. It wasn't really a commercial enterprise. Things are changing. A lot of the stuff is now getting patented and protected. So I would definitely be aware of what's happening with those things. Anybody else? Okay. Yes, that's it. Thanks again for coming in. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks.